Uh, I am going to talk today on the topic of breaking illusions with testing. And before we go into the topic, let's talk a little bit about who am I. Hi, my name is Maret and I am a tester. These days, not everyone is or every team has a tester anymore. Maybe we have someone who does testing, but it just happens so that testing and being a tester, kind of focusing my career has been around this type of, of work. And I've been doing this for, for 25 years. There's a significant conversation going around in the world right now on uh, testing and who should do it. And many teams no longer have specialists like myself. And that's the type of structure that I'm also building uh, a lot of times in my companies, having less of my kind. But kind of the way that I frame it is that, you know, I have these skills. I have many other skills as well. I'm also a programmer. I'm a conference organizer. I'm a conference speaker. Uh, uh, I do many, many different things. I've been a manager over the years. I've been a researcher over the years. And uh, what I need to do is have some choices on where do I use my time. And I generally choose to use my time on testing. And there's obviously a reason why I choose that. I choose to be a tester because what I often find myself doing is that I enjoy the work that I get to do, the work of breaking illusions. When I was talking to one of my colleagues back in, in the days a few years ago, and I quoted him this idea that, you know, I'm a tester, this is what I do, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of existing in the projects, that I don't break the code that they created, I break just their illusions, the developers' illusions typically about the code, or the product owners' illusions about the code. Uh, they kind of thought that was so funny uh, way of framing it, that we are centering uh, our work as testers around illusions, that what they ended up doing is tweeting it, and this uh, quote this saying has kind of you know taken uh, a life of its own it originates uh, from somewhere i've uh, used it and formatted it uh, as part of something that is is kind of central to the way that i test and i think of myself as you know centering my work around breaking illusions so if we think about illusions what are illusions uh, we usually like to think that the software that we created, the software that we, you know, uh, try to pay attention to creating, uh, coded with our full hearts or at least half of our hearts uh, in the in the game, that it would work, and we would definitely usually generally kind of try poke it around a little bit and try that, but we'd want to believe that since we were creating it, it would work, and as someone who focuses and centralizes testing. I approach it with the idea that, you know, I'd love to see it work. I'd love to see that this is true. But there is a chance, and it is an existing chance, that my hopes uh, would be uh, very quickly proven wrong. And I want to approach things rather from the idea that maybe, just maybe, we don't yet know that things work. And that's where, where my work starts. So testing... It is about kind of, you know, looking at things very closely. Sometimes it's looking at yourself very closely, like looking in a mirror and thinking about how are you as that tool who is trying to uh, figure out ways of, of how might I or other people around me be disillusioned with empirical knowledge. But it is this idea of, you know, paying attention, uh, paying attention to spending time with the application, applying uh, uh, use of the software, either with other software or what we call manually, kind of being available, being fully brain engaged uh, into the work and looking at kind of empirically, if I do this, what will happen? What is exactly what will, will happen? And applying a scientific method, kind of like thinking in advance, what do I expect so that we can notice if our own illusions of, of things that used to work yesterday, for example, must be also also broken. But what I still want to emphasize kind of before we get into in further uh, into this breaking illusions topic is that uh, we have illusions about both the good and the bad. I've worked with plenty of project managers who are very optimistic and you know schedule comes first and we always will be able to do the schedule. 
uh, and kind of believing in the on the positive side. But I've worked with equally many uh, project managers who have been worried about the schedule, believing in, in, you know, seeing risks everywhere, seeing that we're probably behind, wanting to actively communicate that that risk and, and behindness to other people. So depending on who I end up working with, I find myself kind of like being the the little like, kind of like a the person who's kind of like going in between uh, the 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 cracks, figuring out the balance on you know if it is overly positive, I will definitely go on the the negative side, and if it's overly negative like actually it is quite often in teams, I find myself being on the good side, kind of like emphasizing also where the illusions couldn't be broken, where we were actually right about things working exactly this way and paying attention to, you know, nice work that people have actually managed to get into that software because I get to see the software both work and not work. And I want to equally, of course, appreciate both. So as a tester, uh, anyone doing testing, what you would be doing is kind of approaching things with the idea that maybe you don't know it all yet. Maybe there is this real chance of things being broken. And unless you want to see that things are broken, you very easily miss relevant information. So breaking illusions requires you to approach things with an open mind and the possibility that there will be information to find. Uh, the way I usually end up doing my work in testing is that kind of like looking at the software in the team that I'm joining. It's, it's like a little bit of like a, this amoeba of going into different directions and it has some sort of a shape. Of course, I'm asking questions with the rest of the team on what the shape is like. But the assignment that I usually go in with is that to break those illusions, I need to go and find not all, but some of what the others may have missed. I get to use my usually mostly my full days on focusing on the ideas of what are we missing? What is the information we don't yet have available? And there is so much of that information that we don't have available that I can't, of course, even myself as a tester getting to centralize my work around this, I don't get to do all of it, but I get to do some of it. And I get to learn over the last 25 years, I've gotten to learn how to go about it in an effective way. A few years ago, I went and, and tested uh, one developer's uh, open source testing uh, tool. And he was encourage, encouraging me on kind of, yeah, sure, go for it. You know, it's all written test first and it's code that he's very proud of. It wasn't only written test first, it was also all written in pair programming style. Uh, but the test suite, existing test suite that you could run with TDD and, and BDD in place was also quite impressive. So I took a look at whatever was, was existing on the, on the documented side. I'm like, this is not where I should be spending my time. I'm going to be looking for something the others have missed. Well, on the developer's words, uh, quoting uh, him from a podcast, I destroyed the application apparently in like an hour and a half. Well, the reality is it took me more like three hours. So, you know, the time was kind of significantly more, but still in a few hours, you can only do quite shallow testing. And the types of things that I did is, is I set up an environment where I could, you know, have the tool uh, in unison with the other tools that you would typically have in a developer's environment where you would want to use a unit testing tool, only to figure out that there were conflicts between the different libraries that you'd expect to have. So kind of system level ideas. I asked and listed many of the functionalities that I was expected to find. And I just, you know, picked some of them that felt like they were maybe, you know, interesting or complex or, or would help me first understand the application. And as I went through the, the features, I would figure out that 
some of them were hard to discover, basically saying that the API needed to be rewritten. And this was the eventual conclusion after longer conversations. And I found many things where things were not actually working when I just, you know, went a little bit outside the basic scenarios using a little bit different data than, than normally people would maybe use in creating it. So it wasn't actually a very complicated thing and it didn't require so much, but it did require this idea of, you know, going with the intent and idea that I am about to break some illusions and find something that others may have missed. I do the same kind of things uh, in various projects. So in the last few weeks at my current work at Vaisala, I've been testing, for example, this is one of those features that I've been testing in the last few weeks. And I've also been using this feature of configuring uh, uh, new airports as a sample for interviewing testers. So I've had a chance of interviewing more than 10 people in the last month or so. Uh, uh, with uh, using this example with many of them. And I've made many of my colleagues do this as an exercise also, because I thought it was really nice way of, of showing uh, what testing really is about and what's required to break those illusions. Uh, asking uh, from that config YAML, uh, what would I change here? How would I test this? Like making it really specific on what kind of things should be different. I learned that way too many of the testers that I interviewed would only choose to basically try values for the latitudes and longitudes, would try values like uh, too big and too small and one that is just right. So kind of like just one positive test case, whereas uh, it turned out that for the implementation of this particular feature, uh, if you would have values such as one of the numbers zero, or one of the numbers uh, set up as, as the Chicago O'Hare uh, O'Hare uh, Airport, the minus 87 point, a lot of decimals after it, uh, you would then end up actually having the APIs uh, giving a, a technical error, not even a 500 of uh, error, but a technical error uh, and the application appearing as if it was working, even though it was no longer receiving data. So a lot of people kind of go in and, and approach it with, uh, I see it work with one scenario and then focus on, I make sure that I can put in, in wrong kind of values, but there is within that positive side, there's also a lot of lot more values to try out. And uh, one of the illusions that I've broken uh, on myself, kind of why I raised this on this, this presentation today, is that I find that I was believing that this is something every tester knows how to do. And with my sample of about 10 people right now, very few people actually know how to do this. And a lot of us over the years, with the years of experience that I also called that I've been having, uh, we've learned to uh, try only the simple things because the simple things already might often be broken. And then in the end, what could have happened for my organization, if no one paid attention to this, is that we would be, for example, selling our system to the Chicago airport only to discover that the whole system doesn't run when it's configured to that particular realistic location. Obviously, over that a couple of weeks, I've also kind of collected various examples now and ended up automating scenarios so that I don't have to pay so much attention to this anymore later on. But someone needs to come up with all of those ideas that we try out in the first place. And sometimes, actually a lot of times, some of my best tester colleagues in the teams are the team's architects and are the team's senior developers who have experience already in the idea that things are different with different data, with different ordering of features. And we are doing great job, you know, co-designing tests and, and, and ideas of how we would test so that we can break our mutual illusions. So it's not just something that is my uh, work and my work alone, even if I am one of those people who gets to specialize in it and use most of my time on problems like this. But, you know, I showed you a couple of examples 
uh, on uh, breaking uh, illusions, finding problems. But the way that I've learned to think about this, this phrase of, of testers don't break the code, they break your illusions about the code, is that uh, it's actually not just the code we're breaking. And the longer I've been in this industry, the more varied my work is, and actually the more I am paid also for the selection of work that I can do, because I am able to have a larger impact by connecting dots from many, many different layers. So again, learning in layers over the years, I've definitely grown my ideas of, of breaking illusions, not just about the, the code, but you know, whatever necessary. So if we look at what I mean by this then, I mean that, uh, well, definitely there's this, what I call basic illusions in, in testing. So we have that code and we're breaking the code and we might have illusions about the code uh, making a product in the first place. So we looked at kind of like code doing what it's supposed to do, not having error messages or, or actually working in the cases where it's supposed to. This is kind of the core of what we think when we think about testing, but that's not the only uh, basic illusion that we are breaking uh, with testing. The other almost, I would say, equally relevant, or maybe in my role, it's usually even more relevant than finding these, this kind of, this is where, where it doesn't break uh, or, or doesn't work, uh, is that sometimes we expect that the product does something. We kind of tell, make claims to our users on what kind of things they get when they pay a number of euros for uh, the product that we are selling them or the service that we're selling them right now. And sometimes uh, the expectations uh, and whatever we have ended up uh, asking the teams to implement don't match and we are not aware of it. So sometimes the product isn't doing what it would need to do. And I think of this in terms of you know, omissions. We are missing features, we're missing sub features, you know, some kind of things that are reasonable to expect that we would have. Uh, the easy examples, of course, on these kind of features, what it needs to do is, is it needs to survive the product that we are creating. It needs to survive when we have users who make mistakes, if they end up not understanding what to write in a field and they end up writing two in letters instead of two in numbers, they should get a helpful error message saying, I don't understand two in letters, only numbers are allowed here. So the simple thing is kind of, you know, error uh, handling. So product isn't doing error handling that it's supposed to do or would need to do. But uh, just as much, it might be that we're completely missing out on some uh, functionality, some kind of features that need to be there, sometimes even features that someone mentioned we should have, but we didn't really go through the list of all expectations systematically. So I spent significant amount of my time in, in figuring out claims all around, some of them more authoritative and some of them less authoritative and clarifying what's in, what's out are we disillusioned in terms of, of what we are delivering? And the third category of basic illusions, security related things. Sometimes we have features that you can use for bad things. Well, it might be that uh, they allow you to break into the, the system. Uh, it might be that they uh, reveal data that wasn't supposed to be revealed, or it might be that they enable use cases like harassment uh, that we definitely didn't intend. But someone also needs to think in terms of the negative uh, kind of misuse cases that we might have around our projects. And all of these types of things are those what I call basic illusions in making the product that we really intended to do. The other kind uh, of illusions then, uh, the more uh, separate ones from the code are kind of towards the ideas leading to code. So the way we work together, whatever way of working we've agreed to have, sometimes it works better, sometimes worse. Uh, ideas around that are very typical for me to address as part of my work. Uh, people, their skills, helping people grow, seeking help for people who are not uh, necessarily always asking for that help themselves. Uh, 
is something I find we hold a lot of illusions around and the business models kind of like making the decisions on this is absolutely the thing we need to uh, implement right now so that we, we are doing the right things for our business and our product and our company. So uh, kind of going outside, just creating whatever was asked and being a part of, of creating the environment that enables us to create the right kind of, of systems. But let's look at a couple of examples first on the basic illusions. Uh, I leave uh, you kind of on this one uh, with uh, the idea that I've created an entire course that you can read uh, on exploratory testing foundations that teaches some of these, these basics. But I just kind of walk you through some of the basic ideas of how this usually works. And I teach in terms of contemporary exploratory testing, meaning test automation is part of the way you do exploratory testing. You can't explore well without automation. You can't automate well without exploring, because otherwise you don't have the right scenarios that will enable you to pay attention to the possible things that could be broken uh, in the, the future rounds of, of your testing. So for this, this course, what I've uh, centered it around is this idea that we take just a very, very small application. And this very small application, it's a good target in the sense that it's uh, really nothing more than what you see in the screen right now. There's a link uh, which basically gives you uh, a Wikipedia page where there's a specification of how E-Prime, a way of using English language without using the verb to be, how that works, what kind of rules does it have. It has these counters of how many words uh, uh, are there in total. Uh, it counts discouraged words and possible violations. And you have this, this text field and a button where you can put uh, whatever entry you want it to have. And my demo uh, sentence here, to be or not to be Hamlet's dilemma, it nicely uh, shows all of the different features that I actually often have to discover myself. It's not like anyone told me what uh, becomes a possible violation. I have learned by using the application and having conversations on it that, you know, it would seem like the possible violations are things where a human intervention on, on, on the inter, uh, uh, the uh, on the interpretation of the, the blue word would be needed. It could be with the to be verb, uh, like a shortened version, or it could be a possessive. Uh, and uh, the implementation isn't yet smart enough to do anything other than categorize it for uh, humans to, to look at. So very, very simple program. Uh, I've had a chance of seeing hundreds of people test this so I see some people notice that uh, my uh, little uh, sample text here, the demo sentence, it actually already introduces a bug. That's not nine words, that's eight words. So the, the, uh, the uh, apostrophe, the, the uh, little character there in, not apostrophe, but the little character there in between the B and Hamlets, it's counted as a word. So uh, clearly the counting isn't the smartest possible algorithm in, in, in this case. And we already have now here a sample of how it might fail. So uh, when you see that the counting can be fooled, some people really dig into the how I can fool the counting and spend their first hour on, on that. Other people are really curious on this color coding and the kind of the final, most representative uh, way for the user to see what's wrong or what's right in their sentence. So they create uh, for automation purposes in particular, they want to create some kind of like a, a logic, a little piece of a, a, a code that would always know how to uh, recognize the red words and the blue words and this uh, uh, user interface is also created in a way where it's not a very complicated algorithm that you need to create, but uh, it usually uh, takes a, a few moments uh, for people to, to write up something that works for different combinations of having and not having uh, the, the blue and, and red words in that, that sentence. So it might be one of those traps where people start and, and they first kind of create that. But there's a more straightforward way for testing with automation, which is just kind of looking at the word counts. The color coding uh, uh, really doesn't uh, uh, differentiate uh, uh, from the, 
the uh, word counts, it's the same logic. Well, especially if you go and look at the code on how it's been implemented, you can make your choices of how you want to use your time based on that. Uh, some people uh, open the specification. They want to understand how the system works. So kind of like getting uh, trapped into creating all the different uh, inputs. And some people start with, uh, let's put all kinds of uh, weird inputs into this text field. All of these are valid openings. And it's not just that uh, uh, wherever we start, we don't have to finish there. We can do all of these, but we will make our choices of what we start with. In exploring this, in spending time and testing this, uh, there's a high possibility that you will end up finding problems. So I've had kind of like documented some of the problems here in various areas. And since I have already spent significant number of hours with various people on uh, this little application, in the end of my testing, I've been able to tell for the future myself and whoever comes after me, how it would make sense to test this. But in order for me to give a very specific strategy on how it is making sense to test this, I had to test it first. So this is not an input to testing, it's an output to testing. And similarly, since I have already spent time exploring it, I also have a set of 16 test cases created in automated parametrized way. And this is actually when you run it, it would reveal that there's 10 problems that, that just these tests uh, uh, are finding. The problems are not well documented on this one. So definitely spending time with something like this, doing, you know, breaking illusions, doing testing, you find, find some uh, bugs, some, you know, specific examples that are not uh, properly recognized if you approach it automation first, but also if you don't spend time just, you know, looking at the application and, and, and thinking in terms of, you know, something outside the, the basic simple test case that I had documented in automation, you might miss many other problems. So you go and you look for something that the others might have missed with the hope that after uh, enough people in your team have gone and looked for the things the others might have missed, together we've built something that is, is relevant. So for me, what this basically is uh, and means is that, you know, I start by the heuristic of I never ever want to be bored. And I've been a tester for 25 years and I still haven't had a boring day. Uh, when I sense that I'm about to be bored, it just means that I am no longer thinking in enough dimensions. I've allowed myself to kind of, you know, drift into this rut and there's an illusion in me that needs to be broken. This work is never supposed to be boring. Uh, if you're logging in with the same user every day and you think that's boring, how about logging in with a different user? When you create a new user today, instead of using that user that you have used for the last year every single day, maybe the new user doesn't work. Has happened to me in real projects. Uh, when you log in with that user, maybe the thing you always do first, maybe you can do something different. Maybe you can actively look for ways of not being bored. And maybe you can, you know, drag someone in to pair test or ensemble test with you in a group, like having a, a group of people. When you look at things with other people's eyes, it is really difficult to be bored and you are almost forced to learn new things about the, the software that you're, you're testing. Uh, on the heuristic side, I also, you know, a lot of my uh, examples uh, the the deliverables, the strategy, the test cases, uh, they are uh, the result of the, uh, the testing being done and an output of that testing rather than input into that testing. So in the beginning, I know the least and I should be paying attention to yet another one of those illusions. Uh, the idea that we already need to know things and that we would know things when we start or that we would try to get to a place where we really know all the things before we start. We will be learning while we are uh, trying to break those illusions. And if we have this learning mindset, you know, every day when we come to work, 52 days a week, uh, or 52 weeks a year, uh, if we are 1% better, we're almost two times ourselves in a year. And if it is every single waking morning, 
that we approach things with a 1% improvement seeking attitude, we could be, uh, you know, competing with our past selves to the scale of almost 40 times better in a year. And probably, you know, it's somewhere between these that you can try uh, getting to. But there's a huge potential in us being able to connect things in a smart way and actively learn about things that save us, us a little time in, in getting the, the work done. And finally, kind of on the heuristic side on how to do this, uh, well, uh, persistence helps a lot. Uh, Alexander Schladebeck, one of my favorite people in the testing uh, field right now, is uh, working around micro heuristics, kind of like describing ways how testers usually approach things. And this poke it until it pops, kind of pay attention, notice something being a little interesting, getting interested in that, and then play with it until you get it to reveal you that things were not as you first imagined they might be. So be open to that broken illusion. Finally, I want to give you a couple of examples of illusions broken outside the field of, of what we directly associate with typical testing uh, on the ideas leading to code. And I think these are, are sort of in the category of this is not what I would expect of a tester. This is something I would expect from an every single professional working in teams that we want to learn to figure out uh, where the truth kind of lies within the ways we work and, and be better at, at improving the, the way we, we work. So I, I've collected some examples on uh, uh, illusions I've ended up breaking. Uh, this is by no means a conclusive list, and I'm presenting them to you today in order of, of, uh, of appearance in my professional life. But it doesn't mean that they couldn't appear in a different order for you. And it probably only implies that when you look around at the illusions you've ended up breaking, the practices where people believe this is not possible or this cannot be done, and yet you can make it work and you can do it through experimentation, maybe you'll recognize some similarities there. Uh, the first example that I wanted to give you is from a few uh, workplaces ago on contractual commitments uh, and us needing to build a new feature. And we had this conversation that I've had over my career so, so many times about this new feature. Customer absolutely wants it. It is really critical. It's business critical. It's something that needs to interrupt everything else right now. It is going to help us, you know, as a product company to go forward. Uh, all of the positive signs are there. And, uh, and yet we have this, you know, nagging feeling a lot of times on the technical team side that maybe there's a slight bit of air in our beliefs of how positive this can turn. So in one of these projects uh, and one of these features, I made a proposal for the business people that maybe, you know, if we believe so heavily on this bringing us the numbers that we were looking at, maybe that particular customer, the main customer wanting that feature, maybe we could already be writing that contract for the first few percentages of money at this point, before we start the feature, at least, you know, it would serve as a great motivation for any of us in the team who sometimes, you know, might be a little, you know, worried that we are building yet again the most important thing and the reality uh, on the most important shows to be different uh, in, in hindsight. So in this particular time, in this particular project, we ended up actually writing that contract. And, and proposing to the customer a small percentage of, of whatever they, they wanted to, uh, or we were uh, assuming we would be getting out of building that feature when they now want to kind of, you know, expand the use of the product in their business, only to actually learn that the, the uh, response to that contract was that uh, they wouldn't be signing it and they were actually expecting that it wasn't going to cost them anything extra. So breaking illusions on something where we would have easily spent entire few teams time on implementing something for next six months 
getting that kind of uh, removed from the agenda or approaching it with a lot more uh, realism in, in how much money it's going to make with the short time investments. Just playing with the idea of, of uh, let's write a contract up front. Uh, uh, that test case is probably one of the, the best ones I've ever ended up implementing uh, outside the, the immediate uh, uh, product uh, team area uh, and having a significant impact on, on whatever we were, were building, building in, the, in the team. So you could, you know, try experimenting with uh, test cases that are not in the regular realm. Another thing that I've tried over the years is ensemble programming. So you might have heard about ensemble programming, sometimes also referred to as mob programming. I really prefer uh, the, the little uh, less uh, violent uh, version of the, the term. And uh, the idea with ensemble programming is that we have a single computer in use for the entire team. And we are all programming together uh, by uh, one of us uh, being the voice of the team, one of us being the hands of the team, and the rest of us using our voices in, in kind of co-navigating, co-voicing uh, through the, the person who's making the, the main decisions and switching regularly who's in each of these these roles for me uh, this was an experience of uh, learning a lot about programming learning a lot about how i could impact with my testing ideas a programming team in the moment and how i can make people forget expensive mistakes ever happening because we get correcting to correcting them in such a short time frame and for me uh, the idea of uh, well, cognitive dissonance as in uh, changing my whole history on remembering that I have been a programmer, uh, well, pretty much since uh, my teenage years when I, I was keen on writing games, uh, was something that kind of, you know, re-centralized my, my ideas around what do I do for my work, uh, teaching me practical hands-on skills. So definitely breaking many illusions on my side, but also on my team's side, on the ideas of what I can and should be doing and what are the benefits of that. Another example that I wanted to share with you is from my previous place of work. So not from where I'm, I am right now, is uh, the, the experiment we did around the phrase, no product owner. So if this is something of interest to you, there are uh, presentations that I've done a few years back on, on this topic. But what we basically did is we agreed that our team of developers no longer had a product owner. The product owner would only go fishing for customer uh, uh, feedback. Uh, all the decision power, all the, the doing power, all the prioritization power was within the team and the product owner would uh, not actually be actively uh, part of that, uh, uh, would just kind of look at the demos like other stakeholders. And within a year, we ended up improving multifold and being quoted as uh, the best team in corporate R&D. A lot of people think this is probably because we were seniors. You know, I had many years, many other people had many years in the industry, but it was actually the sense of ownership. And the 15 year old uh, with the sense of ownership was working exactly the same way as some of us uh, who were uh, much more with a uh, uh, number of years uh, on, on, the, on the plate. But together, us kind of feeling like we are not being uh, ordinaries. We are actually active players and we get to break our own, own illusions together. We really did wondrous things for that, that year together. And it has continued, as far as I have heard from the team, since I left uh, that particular team. Another example is on uh, making shorter releases. This is maybe nowadays my signature move. I join a team, I look at how long does it take to release and uh, release by release, uh, we work towards driving down the time to release. I just, in the end of last year, left the team where we went from 32 days to uh, from the moment when we had everything together to having the release available for the customers. So quite a long testing period to two days. Uh, where the testing period was less less than four hours in that two days, uh, leaving that team again continue without me and now moving on to my, my current team 
where my my current experiment of trying to change the world is around clarifying uh, story uh, accept stories acceptance criteria uh, the way of understanding scope so that we don't again create those ordinaries and we end up giving very specific uh, automatable examples uh, with um, uh, scoping so that uh, we maybe learn to be very specific about what we expect that works after those changes that we are right now about to be making. This is my first time trying to do BDD, so I'm definitely still learning about this, so I'm finding that I have still many illusions to break. One of them being that it seems that when I do my best uh, in finding that acceptance criteria in less than two weeks away uh, from the time when I will be testing the same same thing, about 75% I can find in advance, but 25% of the acceptance criteria I will find when I look at the application and it works as my kind of external imagination. Uh, it whispers me, you would want to try this. And I get to also tell myself how badly I did my best work just a few weeks ago in trying to list all the different criteria. I am my better self as someone who is breaking illusions when I'm looking at the product, when I'm looking at the API, when I'm looking at the code, and that serves as my external imagination as long as I allow myself that room, that breathing space to just look at it and listen to it and think of what would I do differently. Now, uh, a few days older and wiser, hopefully, uh, getting to uh, not obey even my own rules, but uh, uh, break whatever is, is necessary so that we serve our customers, our users the best possible way. So instead of uh, uh, testing, maybe, you know, you want to use different words. I'm fine with that. Maybe you want to talk about examples. Maybe you want to talk about experiments. They're pretty much similar to the type of things that I talk about when I say testing. So all of these, these ways of framing things are, are fine. And while this is something that is big part of, of my professional identity as a tester, I am finding that my main colleagues, developers, uh, uh, definitely product owners as well, are just as much into the space of, of breaking illusions with testing. And I find that in modern agile teams, the people I used to recognize as test managers of the past, they are now product owners and we're actually working on the same kind of information and uh, disillusionment type of work uh, just from little different angles, trying to create a fuller picture in, in this whole thing. So to conclude, I love testing. I think you should love testing too. Uh, there's techniques, uh, design techniques that you can learn. There's approaches, heuristics that help you think in the right way that you will enjoy and never be bored with testing. And the assignment uh, on this one is we go all of us, regardless of our role, to find some of what the others may have missed and never, ever be bored when we're doing resultful testing. Thank you.